Welcome, Gina. Thank you so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books to discuss Below Your House Down, a story of family, feminism, and treason. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Oh my gosh. You are such a good writer. I mean, I'm sure you know this, um, but wow, <laughs> you. You, the writing is so intense and vivid and oh my gosh, it was really, really good. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. So can you tell listeners what your book is about and how you ended up writing it? Why oh, did you write wow. the book? <laughs> so uh, really, it, it, one of the reasons that it's hard to describe what the book is about is because it's about all the messy intersections of a middle-aged life of a woman going off the rails in various <laughs> different ways. Um, so, you know, some self-imposed. Um, part of the narrative is that I am having an extramarital affair for several years of the story. And so obviously that was an off the rails of my own making, but also my best friend dies of ovarian cancer kind of at the onset of the story, which is a bit of the catalyst for a lot of the events. And um, shortly after I leave my marriage, um, after this affair, I my father dies who lives in in my house um and i'm diagnosed with breast cancer and then um i'm then openly in a relationship with the person who was then my lover who's now my husband and his ex-wife gets breast cancer almost immediately after i do and then i end up um in chronic pain from a hip debilitation that was caused by the chemo and I end up having a hip replacement. And so essentially it's all these different things and all the while I'm parenting three kids. And so the book is a hybrid of memoir and cultural criticism. So essentially it not only relays these events in my life and, and tries to look deeply into, you know, both my experience of them how they came to be, but also the role of women in psychiatry, in the medical industrial complex, in the law, all of these various different historical components of women's roles. And in many ways, sort of the invisibility of middle-aged and older women and this sort of false assumption that our inner lives and our changes and our evolutions just sort of stop after this we get married and we have children, which is the end point of so many memoirs uh, about women. Um, and I think that's very industry reinforced, you know, so I'm not saying that in a negative way towards any of the writers of those memoirs. I think there's a big push in the publishing industry to sort of have this happy inspirational ending. And so women may write about like their misadventures of their twenties or their teens. And then at the end, there's this kind of redemption. Okay. I got married. I had children, the sky parted, everything is great happily ever after. So that was my story until it wasn't. And once it wasn't, I realized there were not a lot of books in the marketplace that were speaking to any of these disparate experiences I was having, that most of them that did exist were in self-help. And so I tried to write um, a narrative that would talk about just the collisions of full throttle life and, and what happens to women who are over 40, who, you know, who don't remain in that happily ever after state. Wow. <laughs> I relate to so much of that. And I think that's why I just love this. I also, I'm remarried. I have four kids who I had with my previous husband. There's just a lot of, we have a lot of parallels going on. Um, but, and I lost a very close friend to ovarian cancer. Um, I don't know. I just feel like your story, in addition to being just like literary and beautiful, I just found a lot of myself in these pages, which of course, like, you know, this whole like right to make others feel less alone. I'm like, ah, oh, oh, here we go. <laughs> right, right. And I mean, that really, that was the impetus, you know, how I came to write it, you, you were asking. I mean, I originally was just planning to write a collection of essays about caregiving my parents. My parents lived downstairs for me since 1999. Um, my father died in 2015 and my mother in 2019. They were very eccentric, funny, interesting people. Um, and caretaking them while parenting three kids was an intense enough experience. And so I had been planning to write about that. But, um, but once I got going, I just really realized that a lot of these other things I was writing about in secret, because I felt they were unpalatable that people, you know, 
maybe wouldn't publish them or that it wasn't okay to write about these things. And then I realized that was exactly why I needed to do it because there were so many women out there who just have felt that, you know, some aspect of this has been their experience. And so much of it is still taboo, even things beyond our choosing like illness um, or losing body parts or having, you know, a limp or disability temporarily. Um, and that there's so much shame in women for not just having these picture perfect lives that I was trying to portray for a very long time while, you know, unraveling. Wow. And you did such a good job, even of the, even just like taking us through your whole backstory, right? So that we get to today and how you painted the picture of your dad then and your dad now. So that when you talk about his loss, I feel sad as if I knew him because of the way you wrote about him, which of course is the biggest gift you can give to anyone who's passed away, right? It's just recreating them. And so their spirit, you know, you sort of get to know them. That sounds hokey, but I do believe, I do believe that. Um, like it this, was what I wanted. So thank you. Oh, good. Um, the scene where um, your dad was sitting next to his friend, like from the neighborhood and they were in two sort of wheelchair situations and saying like, Hey babe, Hey babe, you know, and just hanging like, that's it. Like you I don't know, aging and all this stuff that happens to bodies and illness and whatever, like at the end of it, you're just like two friends being like, Hey babe, what's up? I don't know. It was just so poignant to me. Yeah. I really wanted my parents to come to life because I mean, if, if middle-aged women who write books are, you know, if there are a lot of cultural misperceptions about what it is to be a middle-aged woman, certainly there are even more misconceptions about what it's like to be elderly and to be, you know, to have had all the health problems my parents had. My father struggled with mental illness. So, you know, he never graduated from the eighth grade. He, his is not a story that has been very visible in the world. Um, and I really wanted to bring my parents to life very much in the book because they were you know, they were so much to me, to my kids, and just such an, an enormous part of my life. And I feel like people like my parents are not written about very often. And even when you're like, I wish I had gone downstairs, like it seemed like it was hard. So you're, they lived downstairs from you and you were up in your crazy life. And of course, like it becomes hard to even walk downstairs to see your parents. And everybody has a parallel in their own lives. I should call my mom more. I should do this. I should go visit my grandmother. I should, you know. And you, it, it was just such a good reminder. Like you just have to stop and go downstairs. Like yes. that's it. Yes. For such a long time, um, my mother in particular was part of my absolute daily life when she moved in, 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 two, uh, in 1999 and my father as well. But my mother would come up every single morning for coffee. She hung out with me and my daughters constantly. She kind of went everywhere with us. She was really in many ways a co-parent with me. And as my life began to go increasingly off the rails, once I um, was getting my divorce and I had to scramble to find full-time work and then I got cancer and my mom was no longer able to come up the stairs. My father, well, at that point, my father was really living in a recliner by the window. Um, and so it, it, it did, it became almost insanely challenging to continue to have the kind of quality of relationship with them that I had had because so much was happening that I could barely keep my head above water. And so then, yeah, it did make me think a lot about people who only get to see their parents a couple times a year, you know, and, and just how difficult that is. And when their parents get sick and the responsibilities they have to somehow help, and they may live in a completely different area of the country. And I found that hard, even with my parents right downstairs from me. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to read this passage, um, if you don't mind, it's kind of random in this point of our conversation, but I didn't want to forget to do it um, because I just, um, the way you write, I know I've mentioned this, it just stays with me, even these scenes. So anyway, I just want to read this one paragraph. In that Schrodinger's box of uncertainty, my entire life is contained in that in between space, I am both having and not having an affair. Kathy is both living and dead. When I wake in my hotel bed alone, two hours behind Chicago time, Kathy has already been carried away in the cart of my father's dreams. 
That morning, before the phone call comes from my fiance, I dwell on the relative peace of my frantic, overly busy life for the last time before descending into the throes of both grief and feral lust, a dangerous state for a woman, one that makes her feel self-immolating and invincible at once. Kathy, Emily's son, my father, and the woman I thought I was, watch us all shoot brief and bright against the same vast sky one last time. Vibrant, singular, miraculously ordinary, full of love and pain we flash. Then one by one, we are out. Oh, so good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, that, that piece is actually, it's from um, an earlier essay that I had written prior to, well, I was written, of course, prior to the beginning of my fair, as you see at the, at the end of it, um, you know, I get this call from, from Kathy's fiance telling me what had happened. And that's sort of, you know, the beginning of the actions in the book. Um, but in the original version of that essay, I wasn't admitting to unhappiness in my marriage. I wasn't admitting to this attraction to this friend of mine. Um, and so the original version of the essay, which was very much about just going, taking my youngest to visit my old neighborhood, the, the neighborhood I grew up in, in poverty in Chicago, compared to just our neighborhood, some four miles away, and it being a very different world. Um, and, you know, that essay got put in an anthology and so forth. But when I came to revisit it for the book, one of the big realizations I had about so many of the things I'd written about my parents is that I'd really written myself out because I wasn't, I wasn't copying to where I was really at. Even in a case like this, where the affair has not yet begun, I'm, I'm living this sort of pretense of, of being, you know, being this happy person about whom there's nothing to say, right? As Jennifer Burroway says in, in uh, right when she's talking about fiction craft, like in fiction, only trouble is interesting. I mean, obviously that's sort of true of memoir too. And so, because I wouldn't admit to trouble, I was this peripheral narrator on the fringes of these pieces I was writing. So part of the exercise of, of turning this into a book was cracking open old pieces and realizing what I really needed to say about them to make them not true per se, because the things that had happened in them were true, but complete. So let's talk about your affair, if that's okay. Um, because uh, <laughs> let's go there. Um, you you show us in the beginning how at first it's this emotional affair, right? And should you feel guilty? Should you not? Should you tell anybody that you're on the phone for hours? And what does that mean? And you had some line like, you know, if if both my husband and I are unhappy in our marriage, but nobody knows, like as a tree falls in the forest, like does does anyone hear it? Like what does it matter? Um, tell me how it all kind of evolved and how you look back. I mean, you have this context, right? Of women in general and feminism and, sh you know, the, the hist historical treatment of women who cheat, right? And how Scarlet Letter and blah, 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 blah. So just take me, take me through that a little bit. So um, my, my now husband um, who, you know, was my longtime friend and who I then became involved with, um, we first encountered each other when I took a story of his over the transom of a literary ma magazine I was editing in 1998. So we had had um, contact as professionals, as colleagues, for a number of years. We met for the first time in 2006 at a reading at Book Soup that we love book participated in. Um, and then I ended up as a guest writer um, at the program where he teaches full time. and and we became friends. And so we started emailing each other a lot and, you know, occasionally talking on the phone. And at one point he was touring and he, uh, he's also a musician as well as um, a writer. And he came to Chicago. He stayed in our, what I used to call the visiting writer suite in my basement. <laughs> and, and all of this was while we were, you know, we were still platonic, but there was no question that we were becoming very emotionally involved in each other's lives, that we had started to talk about things. And I'm not talking about like sexting or whatever, but we were just talking about intimate things that you, you know, that as adults, we are definitely not encouraged to talk about with people of, you know, whatever gender we are also attracted to, you know, except for our partner. And so I think, you know, 
we were aware from maybe about 2010 to 2012 when the affair began that there was something a little bit beyond in our relationship and the relationship was feeling such a need for both of us that we were very hesitant to stop we were really pretty intent on convincing ourselves that it was harmless that this was as far as it would ever go um and you know once the affair began in 2012 of course we we had to look back and really realize like okay if we had been happy if we had been admitting to ourselves the reality of our lives like this whole kind of two-year period from 2010 to to 2012 would not have transpired you know at one point one of us would have put on the brakes would have said okay we need to go and you know kind of square things with our respective spouses in order to be having this kind of an emotional intimacy with another person on what had by the end become really a daily basis and so you know so definitely um you know one of the things that was really important to me is that I show the complications of having an extramarital affair because although I guess, you know, it, it, in the end, whatever, it worked out in the sense that we stayed together, I did not want to confuse the narrative. Um, the narrative is very much about feminism. It's very much about, about women's roles, about women being able to own our own feelings and have agency in our lives. But I did not want to confuse that with agency should include lying to all the people who you know and, and you know, having a double life. And, and so that those two things are separate. And so, I mean, I, I view very much that having an affair was not in any way a feminist act. It was, it was the opposite, really, because it was a silencing of myself. It was you know, a betrayal of so many people, not just my former spouse, but so many different people, because when you're carrying a secret like that, every time you even have a conversation with anybody, you know, everything you're not saying makes your relationship a lie. And so, you know, a lot of it is kind of looking back at what factors in my life and what things I had internalized that had not allowed me to really own up to how unhappy I had been in my marriage for eight years before I left it and, and what those factors had been and why I had been so afraid to step outside of this box of this woman who looked like I had this perfect life, you know, and the success story or whatever of having grown up in poverty and now I was married to a successful man and I had these three beautiful children and, you know, all of this and, and, and just essentially, you know, if I can say so, like my own internal bullshit that like that led me to not be real with myself and therefore not be real with other people. And although I did eventually voluntarily break that cycle by confessing, um, you know, that didn't make things immediately easy either going from an affair, which in a sense is protected by a bubble. You're not each other's real life person on the ground. And so it's extremely easy for everything to be quite harmonious and, and just intoxicating. And then you become each other's real life partners and things become much more complex. And so, you know, it took us about two years to really figure out how to be a real life couple on the ground and how to be there for each other in a way that was inclusive of my kids and all of these different things. And so I, I really wanted to show that I didn't want it to just be some fairy tale story. We had a very intense love and still do. And I wanted that to be visceral, but I also wanted it to be extremely complicated and to show the consequences. And how are things now? Oh, they're fantastic. I mean, you know, we're, we, we got married at the beginning of the pandemic on Zoom. Um, we've been living together now since 2017. I mean, you know, it, thankfully much of, you know, what was going on in the book was quite a, a while ago now. Um, so things, things are wonderful, but, you know, but they also, I don't want to overstate it in terms of, I mean, I, neither of us, we both led complex and difficult lives in many ways prior to our affair. But in, in many ways, you know, we had both been married for two decades or more. And 
there is a sort of end of innocence when you realize that you can have been committed to someone for that long and have really believed like this wasn't these weren't starter marriages like that you really in both of our cases really believed like this is the person we're going to die with this is the how this story ends and had both been really happy in our marriages until we weren't and and then the slow decline of all of that um so you know, so there is a way in which no matter how ecstatically happy we are together and how deeply in love we are, there is always this kind of awareness of like, I didn't, I didn't ever believe I would be in this place. And this sort of, um, you know, I guess an undercurrent of grief that, you know, that life is so changeable and transient that change is the only thing we can ever be certain of and that you know you can think with everything you have that this is it this is the end this is how I'll always feel and maybe it isn't you know so we're much more volitional and 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 daily in our relationship like we are we, we check in a lot we communicate a lot and I think a lot of marriages stop doing that because you just you just assume you know that something is static when maybe it isn't so interesting. No, I had this, um, I had this moment the other day, I was in my car with my husband now and my kids. Um, and I flashed back, we drove past the house that I used to live with, with my former husband when back when I only had two kids and I, everything was different. And I was like, how can I even be on the same street? Do you know what I mean? Like, how can I just be driving down the street when everything has changed? And I thought that was going to be my life forever. And now how, like, I could never have fast forwarded mm. and believed, I wouldn't have believed myself. So I, if, I hear you. Yes. I would not have believed myself. If someone yeah. had told me, you know, 15 years ago that this was what was going to happen. I mean, I would have thought it was inconsistent with absolutely everything about myself. I would have thought that, you know, that there was no way that, that this could possibly be true. Um, you know, many things, not just the affair, but all the different ramifications, the impact that it had on my family, things that happened after the divorce. It just, it is inconceivable. And I still live in the same house that I lived in during my former marriage. And, and I live in a neighborhood where my kids went to elementary school and where both my daughter and I went to high school and, and, you know, where I used to hang out with Kathy and where my mother and father and I all lived and hung out. And so my life is a bit of a ghost town, you know, all of these people who used to be here, it's like I drive around or walk around in my neighborhood and it's like I can see all these versions of my former self with all these different people who either don't exist anymore at all or don't exist in my life. And it is, it's a very surreal experience to, you know, to, to lead many lives. I am so glad to talk. I mean, I feel like this all the time, whenever I, even just on the street here in New York and I'm like, the, uh, you know, if I could do one of those flip books, right. And start when I was a little girl, cause I'm also living in the same neighborhood and this, you know, like right here and my parents and all of it. And yet like the time, the years are just going flip, flip, flip and like different people. And yeah, like you said, different people are gone and I'm different casts of characters. And yet the same street, I'm like, if I could have a camera on like this corner of this block, you know, anyway. True. And I mean, I, and I grew up in Chicago. I've lived away from Chicago for about a decade of my life at various different times, but I grew up in Chicago as well. And, um, you know, and so I've been here a very long time and I've owned this house for a very long time. And so now my husband and I have a place um, near Joshua Tree in, in California that he's had for 20 years. And we spend time out there and that's surreal in a whole different way. I didn't even know literally that Joshua Tree National Park existed until I was in my late forties. You know, I mean, I, it's not a place I had ever spent any time, the California desert. And so when I'm out there at this house, that's now ours and that we're renovating and I'm driving, looking at the mountains and driving through the desert and there's this desert wind. And I'm just sort of like, 
who is this person? Like, what is this, this life? You know, it's so completely different from anywhere else I've ever lived. I've lived in cities my whole life. I mean, I've moved around a lot, but they've all been cities, uh, cold cities. <laughs> so, so yeah, you know, just that inhabiting of many different experiences and many different lives that I think, as you said, is it's not exceptional by the time you reach a certain age. It's it's almost normative. Like half the people out there, this is their experience of their lives. Maybe they didn't have an affair, but this is still their experience of their lives of that they had this life until they had this life, you mm -hmm. know? And, and so I think that that's just something that isn't addressed enough. You know, we believe um, as a culture but certainly also in the in the publishing industry in endings and um and really i say it in the book like the only ending is death like we we just keep changing and you know new things keep coming and lives get more layered and more complex the older you get not less which is the way I think we treat older people in, in society is though they've somehow become simplistic and adorable and, you know, and it's just like as if they don't have more complexity than we do with everything they've lived through. So true. Oh, my gosh. Um, OK, do you have any advice for aspiring authors? Oh, I do. I have so much advice for aspiring authors. So I have been um, in the literary world since about, I, I used to be a therapist and, and then I started writing a novel and calling in sick to work all the time. And, and um, I went back to get my master's in, in creative writing in English. Um, and immediately one of the wonderful things that happened to me was I became involved with a magazine called Other Voices that was housed at the place I was going to graduate school. And I started volunteering my time there as a reader. And I eventually became the executive editor of that magazine, launched a press from that magazine through that. I ended up in, in the Nervous Breakdown community, which is an online community that still exists now at the Rumpus. I'm now the creative nonfiction editor at LARB. Um, and I feel, and there have been other editorships as well. I just feel so strongly that people who want to write, who want to publish, have to find ways to get immersed in their peers, right? You know, it's not just, oh, I've read the great books of history, but finding ways to get involved in the on the ground literary community of your life. And not everyone can do that by volunteering many hours as an editor. Oftentimes these things are unpaid, but we can all go to readings instead of just going to dinner. And we can, you know, we can all like if we've you know read a book and we're passionate about it and that author is coming to town, like maybe you have time to do an interview with that author and and place it and promote their work. And, and so, you know, to whatever greater or lesser degree you can, you know, you can afford time wise and, and economically, there are always ways to get involved. And I'm just surprised how many people, students and things like that, who want to be writers, who don't know any other writers and who are not reading contemporary fiction or nonfiction. And, this is your world and it's such a rich world. It's rewarded me. My life as an editor and my life as a teacher have rewarded me in ever like absolutely just as much as, as publishing my own books. Wow, that's great advice. I think sometimes people don't know where to start, but anyway, it's fantastic advice. Um, Gina, thank you. Thank you so much. I hope I get to meet you in real life. Um, it's so been too. such a pleasure and what a, what a book. I mean, amazing. Um, really great. Congratulations. And thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you for having me. My pleasure.